All right, welcome to Equipping Hour. I'm going to open in prayer, and we'll get started this morning. Heavenly Father, it is a joy to gather together on a Sunday morning in commemoration once again, as we do every week, that the tomb is empty, that you conquered death, that you paid for sin, and that your payment was acceptable before your Father. You rose from the dead as a demonstration not only of your power over death and life, but of your justifying work of sinners. That adequate payment was made for every crime committed against your holiness, past, present, and future, for all those who will trust you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have credited to our account your own righteousness and taking into your account our sins, that we might be free, that we might be forgiven, that we might be inheritors of eternal life. And with that forgiveness comes a whole host of promises. You are a promise-making and promise-keeping God, and you do not lie, and you do not go back on your word. And this has tremendous anchoring import for us. We can bank on your words. We can trust your ways. We can rely on your promises. Uh, to these we cling, O Lord, by faith and help our unbelief in it. And may we trust you and trust you evermore, for you are the trustworthy one. We ask that you'd help us this morning as we study your word once again, that you might be glorified, that you might be honored for who you are, that you might be honored even on our own hearts as we resonate with what you have said. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12. We're continuing this morning our study of Israelology, sort of a compound word, a study of Israel. Israel is a word that shows up in your Bible more than 2,700 times. It is a word that demands our attention. What do we do with this word Israel? Uh, who is it? What does it represent? That's the course of our study here uh, last week, this week, uh, and at least next week uh, in our time in Equipping Hour. We'll see how, how far along we get in this study this morning. We've been looking at Israel in terms of her past, present, and future. And I have up on the slide for you again a series of resources. This slide will come again at the end of the study. If you want to snap a picture of this, uh, you may. Um, whenever it comes up, there you go. Uh, if you'd like that list of resources, if you're interested in further study, just email or text me. I'd be happy to send that to you. Uh, the last one on there is a, is a uh, journal article from the Master's Seminary Journal. Uh, if you have a hard time finding that, just let me know. And those are, those are helpful resources for further study. The best resource, of course, for studying Israel is our Bibles. We looked last week at the history of Israel. Uh, we looked at the Israel in her past. And part of the past of Israel is the covenants we'll jump into this morning. But we looked at Israel's inauguration. When did Israel begin? Uh, in Genesis chapter 12, her incubation under the under the auspices of the world empire of Egypt, where she grew from 70 people to some 2 million plus, the population of Israel, the constitution of Israel, and then the relationship by God's design of Israel to the nations around. Israel was to be loyal to Yahweh, but the one true God, there's no other God, it's not as if Yahweh was a regional deity for Israel in competition with the other regional deities of the other nations. No, Israel had a special relationship to the only God there is, and God marked out this nation to make his own name known, to make his own ways known and his glory known in the world. And then we looked at Israel's spiritual condition in the past. Uh, glimpses of faithfulness, glimpses of fidelity to Yahweh, but overwhelmingly given over to idolatry, worshiping the not-gods the false gods, the pagan deities of the surrounding nations, being given over to sin and rebellion. You, you can't think of a people with higher privilege and greater access to truth and goodness in God. 
You can't think of a people more blessed by the experiences of rescue and protection and provision than Israel in the Old Testament. And what do we see in Israel's turning away from everything good? We see the heart of man. I hope when you read your Old Testament and you read generation after generation of Israel's failures, you read that somewhat autobiographically. (laughs) But for the grace of God, there go I. Maybe you see in Israel's uh, rebellions vestiges of your own hard attitudes. What is it like to have great exposure to the truth of God? What is it like to have wonderful experiences under the hand of the provision of God and even the rescue of God and still turn in your heart to lesser things, to other things? This morning, we turn our attention to the covenants. And this becomes important for us because it it traces out for us God's relationship to Israel. The covenants are part of the skeletal framework of your Bible. Our God is a covenant-making and covenant-keeping God. A covenant is simply a serious promise. It is a serious promise. Some of these promises or covenants in the Old Testament are unilateral. That means they are one-way covenants. God makes a promise, and it doesn't matter what any other party does. And some of them are bilateral or two-way covenants. God makes promises contingent on the response of the other party. Now, not all of these covenants relate to Israel. If you think about the covenant that God made with Noah, the Noahic covenant, predates Israel. This is after the flood, but before there is such a people as Israel. And God makes a promise with the symbol of the rainbow in the sky that He will not again destroy all the earth and all of its creatures by water. That is a covenant promise of God that is unilateral, unbreakable. It is not dependent on the obedience or disobedience of man, and God will keep His promise, and all the world benefits from that promise. But the promises God made to Israel begin for us in Genesis chapter 12. We have, first of all, the Abrahamic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. And there are texts up there indicating where we find this Abrahamic covenant. It begins in Genesis 12. Read with me. Now Yahweh said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. A remarkable set of promises to Abraham. And this is an unconditional covenant or a unilateral covenant, a one-way covenant. God is calling out an idolater, a polygamist. He comes from Ur of the Chaldees. He comes from the neighborhood of the Tower of Babel itself. And God calls him to leave his past, leave his family, leave his land, and join with Yahweh in a new relationship in a new territory, to be a new people. And in this Abrahamic covenant, a one-way covenant, a unilateral promise, God promises Abraham that he will make of him a great nation, bring him to a land, make of him a great people, and bless him. And furthermore, that blessing one day would extend to all the families of the earth. This is a grand sweeping promise to one man that will one day encapsulate all of humanity. It's a stunning promise. And notice that it follows on the heels of the rebellion of Genesis chapter 11. Just as there were promises that followed on the heels of humanity's rebellion in Genesis 6 through 9, after the flood, God makes the Noahic covenant. Here, after the Tower of Babel, God makes the Abrahamic covenant. He picks for himself a man to be a family, to be a people, to eventually bring God's blessings to the world. Turn to Genesis chapter 15. In a stunning set of images here, God makes clear that His promise is inviolable 
and unilateral. That means God will not go back on His word, and God is making a one-way promise. Abram says in verse 2 of Genesis 15, O Lord Yahweh, what will you give me since I am childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Abram said, Since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of Yahweh came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And you know the, the story here, the, the man for whom it was impossible to have a child, with a wife for whom it was impossible to have a child, God does the impossible and brings out the promise essentially from nothing, from what would be humanly speaking, hopeless. And God took him outside, verse 5, and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants or your seed be. Then he believed in Yahweh, and it was reckoned to Abram as righteousness. A really critical piece of God's redemptive plan where we see Abraham is not reckoned righteous because of his deeds, but because of faith. And he said to him, I am Yahweh who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. And he said, O Lord Yahweh, how may I know that I will possess it? So God said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to God, and Abram cut them in two, and laid each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. The birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, and Abram drove them away. What a, what a strange thing this is. What, what is Abram doing? He's taking these animals, and the larger animals, he's cutting them in half. And the way a covenant was made in the ancient Near East was to split an animal in half, and the two parties who would make an agreement would walk between the two halves of the animal. And the, the stench and the, the violence of slaughter and the blood spilt would be a very tangible emblem of the seriousness of the promise made. These two parties, often walking hand in hand together between the carcasses, would essentially be saying, may what happened to these animals happen to me if I break the deal. This is solemn. This is serious. This is to be an inviolable agreement. We do various things to stress the solemnity of an agreement. Uh, we, we emboss pieces of paper and we sign them. And if you're signing a mortgage, mortgage agreement, you've got to sign it 18,000 times. We will place our hand on the Bible and, and swear. Maybe you'll put your hand over your heart. Maybe you'll take an oath with your hand up in the air. Uh, we do various things to solemnify an agreement, to, to take an oath or, or to make some sort of vow. This would have been very serious. I'm not suggesting taking up this practice. May your household pets be safe. But the point is, in the ancient Near East, these sorts of agreements were very, very serious. Uh, the calling of oaths upon yourself, may, may death occur to me if I break my piece of the bargain was serious. What do we see in this scene? Abraham has prepared the way where these two parties would walk hand in hand between the carcasses. Verse 12, now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. I don't think he was bored here. I think this is supernatural. And behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. God said to Abram, Know for certain that your seed will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I will judge the nation whom they serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You'll be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Verse 17, it came about when the sun had set, it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between the pieces. You see, God and Abraham did not go together between the carcasses. God went alone. 
Verse 18, on that day, Yahweh made a covenant with Abraham saying, to your descendants, to your seed, I've given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river of Euphrates. And then he lists the peoples that are there. The Hebrew verb to make a covenant is literally to cut a covenant. We use the phrase in our day to cut a deal. But to cut a covenant takes you back to the scene of the ancient Near Eastern practice where the animals were split in two and the carcasses were there on either side and the two parties walked through. In this agreement, the Abrahamic covenant, God walks alone. God makes a unilateral promise. It does not depend on Abram's obediences. It does not depend on his behavior. It does not depend on the spiritual condition of his descendants. God is making a promise that will not be violated. Let's move to the Mosaic Covenant. Mosaic Covenant. We just mean the covenant that God gave to and through Moses. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Look at verse 1. Now it shall be, if you diligently obey Yahweh your God, being careful to do all His commandments which I command you today, Yahweh your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. You'll be overtaken by blessings. What do we discover in the, the first words of the statement of this covenant? If you do this, I will do this. This covenant is different. Rather than a unilateral covenant or a one-way or unconditional covenant, this is a two-party covenant where the two ends, the two parties, must each hold up their end of the bargain. What is the task of Israel? To obey Yahweh's commandments, to be careful to do all of them. And if they do that, they will be blessed. Look down at verse 15. But it shall come about if you do not obey Yahweh your God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I charge you today, that these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Remarkable thing in this covenant. Blessings for obedience, curses for disobedience. This is perhaps the the way we normally think about humanity's dealings with God. This is is the way that man-made religions sort of try to go about making a bargain with God. I'm going to do things and and God's going to give me what I owe. The stipulations here in the Mosaic Covenant were good They were ordained for Israel's good and for God's glory, and they were ordained specifically for Israel's uniqueness among the nations to be a magnet towards Yahweh for a watching world. And yet we see the the ways that man in his natural thinking thinks about God in this. Isn't it normal? In fact, every human religion is based on this very normal mindset that says, hey, I'm pretty good, I've got what it takes, Uh, I'm going to do these things for God, and God's going to bless me in return. And we find that uh, the hopes of such natural thoughts ought to be dashed, even on the pages when this covenant is delivered. Uh, Look down at verse 36. After talking about all of the the curses that will come if they disobey, God promises this, Yahweh will bring you and your king, whom you set over you, to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone, you'll become a horror. Now, of course, we fast forward, we know the end of the story, God is already predicting their disobedience. The fact that they have a king means they will have rejected Yahweh as their king. They want a human king like the other nations. And in the end, that will be a curse and a snare for them. And they will, as a nation, disobey God. They will not be careful to do all that Yahweh commanded. And God will give them over to the things they craved for. 
the idolatries of the nations that they envied. God will give them over into captivity. Verse 47, because you did not serve Yahweh your God with joy and a glad heart, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom Yahweh will send against you. All of these things will come about uh, because they disobeyed. Look at verse 58. If you are not careful to observe all the words of this law, which are written in this book, to fear this honored and awesome name, Yahweh your God, then Yahweh will bring extraordinary plagues on you and your descendants, even severe and lasting plagues, miserable and chronic diseases. He will bring back on you all the diseases of Egypt, of which you were afraid, and they will cling to you. Every sickness. There will be few of you left because you did not obey Yahweh. Verse 63 It shall come about that as Yahweh delighted over you to prosper you and multiply you, so Yahweh will delight over you to make you perish and destroy you, and you will be torn from the land where you are entering to possess it. These are terrifying words. When you get to chapter 29, remember this is Moses speaking to the people of Israel before they enter the land. They haven't even set foot in the promised land yet. And here's God's assessment through Moses, 29 verse 4. To this day, Yahweh has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. If they are left to themselves, what will be the result? If humanity is left to itself, with a bargain before God. If you live up to my expectations, you get to live and be blessed. What did Israel do with such a promise? They failed. What does humanity do with uh, such a a self-struck bargain before man, before God? Uh, Whatever mankind sets as the standard for himself, he fails to meet. Whether mankind historically seeks to put himself under Mosaic law or some other religious regulation or some self-governed set of rules, make your own resolutions. I'll, I'll ask you January 10th how that's going. Mankind can't live up to any standard, any expectation set over him. We have a fundamental problem. Israel, like All the rest of humanity had the fundamental problem of the disease of sin, an inclination away from God, a bent towards disobedience. It flows out of our nature. So this Mosaic covenant, which the New Testament calls the Old Covenant, will serve as a foil and a contrast to another covenant, the New Covenant. We'll come to that in a moment. Let's look next at the Davidic covenant, the Davidic covenant. This covenant was given to Israel. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. And the Davidic covenant, broadly speaking, like the Abrahamic covenant, is an unconditional covenant. There aren't two parties uh, initiating some sort of an agreement here. God is the one who is making specific promises. And yet we will see a conditional element to this unconditional covenant. Look at 2 Samuel 7, beginning in verse 8. Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, I took you from the pasture from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone. I have cut off all your enemies from before you. I will make you a great name like the names of the great men who are on the earth. I will also appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may live in their own place, not be disturbed again, nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly." Even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, I will give you rest from all your enemies. Yahweh also declares to you that Yahweh will make a house for you. 
And when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your seed after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This, the Davidic covenant, is another promise of God, a unilateral promise, an unconditional promise. And you notice some key words in there. The word seed was in there again, picking up on the seed promise that takes us all the way back to Genesis 3.15. The promise God made to the serpent that a seed of the woman would crush the head of the snake and rest would come through that one. You see the word rest here in the Davidic covenant as well. You also see land. You see people and a great name and a kingdom. All of these things are tied together and we see being woven together in the Davidic covenant the gospel in Genesis 3.15 with the Abrahamic covenant of a family and seed and descent and a great people and land and blessing. And then there is also in this covenant tied up the Mosaic covenant, blessings for obedience and cursings for disobedience. Keep reading with me in verse 13 or verse 14. I will be a father to him that is a descendant of David, and he will be a son to me. And when he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever forever. In accordance with all these words and all this vision, so Nathan, the prophet, spoke to David. Now up to verse 13, we we might have been thinking, okay, seed, promise, land, people, great name, blessing, must be talking about Jesus. And the answer to that is, well, yes and no. No, because... Immediately in verse 14, we have this statement, I will be a father to him. Who's the him? Uh, the, the descendant, the seed that comes forth from David. And when he commits iniquity, I will correct him. Well, listen, if, if we're talking about Jesus here, and if Jesus commits iniquity, then he is not the seed promise of David that could qualify as Messiah and actually pay for our sins. There is a more immediate referent to this descendant of David. It is David's son and son, son, and son, 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 and son, 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 son. Until we finally find the seed of David who does not commit iniquity. What happened with Solomon? Solomon sinned grievously against Yahweh. He established the the building, we looked at this last week, that David assembled all the materials for and dedicated the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. And three chapters later, he's committing grievous adultery and idolatry with pagan women, leading the entire nation into disobedience and eventually causing the schism between the tribes of Israel, the ten tribes of the north and the two in the south. Uh, There were only three kings over a unified Israel. After that, it was all divided and then dispersed. And yet, over and over again, from Solomon's disobedience to the sons of Solomon down through the Davidic line, all of their kingly rules and all of their disobedience, we get this refrain that for the sake of David, God would preserve the line. The northern tribes of Israel, they did not follow linear descent in terms of their kings. They experienced anarchies and overthrows and rebellions and the family line of the thrones of the northern tribes kept changing. But in the southern tribes, in Judah, in Jerusalem, it was always the line of David. Sometimes that line of descent came down to one baby. In fact, twice the Davidic line narrowed down to one single male and God miraculously preserved them. Why? For the sake of David which is shorthand not for because David was the sinless bestest guy that ever lived. It's shorthand for God's own commitment to his own promises. That God made a promise to David and he will not lie. And for the sake of David, he would uphold this line and he would bring about a Davidic seed who would qualify 
to fulfill these promises. This is how we get the conditional nature of the Davidic covenant. It depends on which generation and which seed. And the unconditional nature of the Davidic covenant, there is a seed coming who will absolutely fulfill these. Let's look at the New Testament for a moment. Turn to Luke. Chapter 1. In the introduction of Jesus the Messiah... We get this statement, if, if we have paid attention to our Old Testaments, we come to this statement and it is striking. Luke chapter 1, verse 32. This one who is conceived in Mary's womb shall be named Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Do you understand that the New Testament has not changed or altered or transferred the inviolable promise of 2 Samuel 7? The New Testament affirms that God is still going to do what he promised. A descendant of David would be king and would reign forever over Judah and Israel. In fact, he would have the throne of his father David. If you trace out every single use of the phrase throne of David, Old Testament and New Testament... It always refers to an actual political seat of authority in Jerusalem over a united monarchy in Israel. That doesn't change from Old Testament to New Testament. This becomes important for us in understanding why is God a covenant-making God? Why is He a covenant-keeping God? And what does this have to do with us who are not in Israel? What does this have to do with us Gentiles who are outsiders to the covenants brought in? My friends, these realities that we're looking at, while this is under the banner of Israelology for our study, have much to do with us. We'll come to that at the end of our time this morning. We need to know that God keeps His promises. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 17. How does David respond to the reception of this promise? He responds in worship. 1 Chronicles 17, the first half, gives the, uh, another version of the statement of this Davidic covenant. And verse 16 gives us David's response. David the king went in and sat before Yahweh and said, who am I, O Yahweh God, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? This was a small thing in your eyes, O God, but you have spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come and have regarded me according to the standard of a man of high degree, O Yahweh God. What more can David still say to you concerning the honor bestowed on your servant? For you know your servant, O Yahweh, for your servant's sake and according to your own heart, you have wrought all this greatness to make known all these great things. O oh, Yahweh, there is none like you, nor is there any God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And what one nation in the earth is like your people Israel, whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make you a name by great and terrible things in driving out nations from before your people whom you redeemed out of Egypt. For your people Israel, you made your own people forever, and you, O Yahweh, became their God. Now, O Yahweh, let the word that you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house be established forever and do as you have spoken. Let your name be established and magnified forever, saying, Yahweh of hosts is the God of Israel, even a God to Israel, and the house of David your servant is established before you. For you, O my God, have revealed to your servant that you will build for him a house Therefore, your servant has found courage to pray before you. 
Now, O Yahweh, you are God, and you have promised this good thing to your servant, and now it has pleased you to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever before you. For you, O Yahweh, have blessed, and it is blessed forever. What is David's response? Grace, God be praised for your glory, for your namesake. And then David appeals to Yahweh to keep the promise that he's already made. That's an interesting prayer. God, you promised to do something. Oh God, would you please do that something? That's right. That is the heart of a servant resonating with the heart of his God. This is David's heart. His heart turns to doxology, to worship. Have you ever been given a gift an extravagant gift, a, a large gift, the, the kind of gift that makes you feel small. Words can't express gratitude. You want to try some frivolous thing to, to pay back, and you know that just insults the giver. That is the reality of grace. Grace makes us small all over again. It, it brings us low to where we ought to be. Not in some sort of groveling sense, but in just abject gratitude of, I'm the creature, he's the creator, how is he so kind to me? When David says, you know who your servant is. He knows what's in his heart, he, he knows what he deserves. Not grace upon grace, promise upon promise, blessing upon blessing. But we all deserve judgment and condemnation. And grace brings us low and humble in such beautiful ways. This is David's response. Think about the the twin nature of this Davidic covenant. Conditional in the sense that God says he will do it. uh, Sorry, did I say unconditional? I can't remember what I said. Unconditional in the sense that God said he would do it. But conditional generation by generation. David's immediate descendant, Solomon, failed. We see the unconditional nature of this promise kept and that Solomon still had a son in the Davidic line that had another son, that had another son, that had another son, all the way down to Jesus. And we see the conditional nature of this in the sense that Solomon sinned and had to receive the discipline of the Lord. Let's talk about the new covenant the new covenant. We think about the new covenant as being new. We read in the New Testament. That's, there's a reason we call that the New Testament. It, it is another way of saying the new covenant. It is a contrast to the old. The old referring specifically to the bilateral agreement that God made with Israel. If you obey me, I'll bless you. You'll get to experience the Genesis 3.15 promises and the Genesis 12 promises and the 2 Samuel 7 promises. And if you disobey me, it's Deuteronomy 29. Cursings, disease, exile, dispersion. The new covenant was not invented in the New Testament. As if... God had to make a course correction when the hopes that he had for Israel just came to a grinding halt. When they went down in flames like the Hindenburg, and I guess I need to find another way, another people, another plan. The new covenant is not God's plan B. This, in fact, was God's plan A from the beginning. I want to turn, first of all, to Deuteronomy chapter 10. There are famous passages that we go to quickly for the new covenant. Maybe you're thinking of Jeremiah 31, maybe Ezekiel 36 and 37. But this goes, this goes back pretty far. Deuteronomy chapter 10. Again, Deuteronomy is Moses' sermonic prep for the people going into the land. I believe this entire book of Deuteronomy was spoken in in one speech before the people, just before Moses is about to die, and just before the people are about to go into the land. And listen to Deuteronomy chapter 10, starting in verse 12. 
And you hear Moses imploring the people here. Now, Israel, what does Yahweh require from you? What does he require? To fear Yahweh your God. To walk in all his ways. To to love him. To serve Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And to keep Yahweh's commandments and his statutes which I'm commanding you today for your good. Listen, this is a reasonable request. God rescued Israel. God stamped his name on them as their identity. And he says, just fear me, walk in my ways, do what I say. This is a totally rational and reasonable request. And then look at verse 14. Sort of to emphasize the reasonableness of this, he says, Behold, to Yahweh your God belong heaven and the highest heavens and the earth and all that is in it. Now, what's the implication there? God owns everything. From the distant pulsars and the quasars down to subatomic particles and everything in between, there's nothing God does not own. Of all the land and all the seas and all the creatures on them and in them, God owns every bit of it. How much more should he own your heart and your affections and your obedience and your reverence? Of course God should have you, Israel. He owns everything. You should willingly, freely surrender your lives to him as living sacrifices. This is a totally reasonable expectation. And verse 15, to emphasize it further, yet on your fathers, of all those things out there, of all the peoples on the earth out there, on your fathers did Yahweh set his affection to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, even you above all peoples, as it is to this day. So this is just piling on reason upon reason upon reason. God rescued you and brought you here to this day. God owns everything, and furthermore, God set his affections specially on you. Every reasonable excuse for them to live faithfully before Yahweh. So, verse 16, here's the command. Circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. Well, that's jolting. We went from what was reasonable to what is impossible. There is a spiritual condition that is plaguing the people of Israel that they themselves cannot solve. They have hard hearts and stiffened necks. This is a microcosm for the human problem. This is reminiscent of Jesus' command to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you must be born from above. You must be born all over again. And if you were Nicodemus, you probably would ask the question, wait, my mother's womb, what's, uh, I'm not computing, what? And here, on the plains, in the desert, outside the promised land, Moses telling the people, circumcise your hearts. Have a, have a surgical procedure, non-physical, spiritual, done to you on the inside. Have that done to you. It's a passive imperative. It's a command to have a spiritual operation. This is impossible. This very reasonable command, very reasonable expectation, very appropriate obligation for a sinful human heart is frankly impossible. It's an impossible standard. Fast forward to Deuteronomy 30. You remember that Deuteronomy 28 was the promises for blessings for obedience. Deuteronomy 28, the second half into Deuteronomy 29, was the cursings for disobedience and the predictions that you will not obey, you will disobey, you'll be taken into captivity. And Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. After being outcast, a promise that God will bring them back into the land which their fathers possessed. Moreover, verse 6, Yahweh your God will, look at this, circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed, your descendants, 
to love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, so that you may live. See, we're already getting into the unconditional elements of the conditional Mosaic covenant. Mosaic covenant was the, was the two-party deal where if you do this, I'll do this. If you do this, I'll do that. But what does God do in the midst of that conditional covenant? He says, circumcise your hearts. We can't. I will circumcise your hearts, God says. In effect, God is saying, you will not obey, and I will spiritually bring you to the place where you can and you will and you will love me. So even down into the conditional promises of God, you have the character of God as a covenant-keeping God, a promise-making and promise-keeping creator and redeemer who will bring about salvation even amongst rebellious, sinful people who have no capacity to obey. Again, when we're looking at Israel, you're looking at a microcosm of the human heart. When you're looking at God's redemption of Israel, you're looking at a microcosm of God's redemptive plan. God promises grace and blessing to bring us humble and small in, uh, in grateful, humble gratitude. And he promises to do a supernatural work in the heart, even to these people, Israel, who would rebel generation after generation. Of course, this is echoed throughout all of the places the new covenant is promised. Turn to Jeremiah 31. This is probably the flagship text for the new covenant. And maybe you've been scribbling down all those references on the screen there, or maybe you took a a picture of it. If you want those references again, you can uh, email me or text me. Uh, for those references. Listen to Jeremiah 31. Behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob, uh, house of Judah. Uh, what is this new covenant? It's a contrast, verse 32. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares Yahweh, But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And they will not teach again each man to his neighbor, each man to his brother. No, Yahweh, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares Yahweh. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Who is God making this promise to? The same people he made the promise of that older covenant. This is still to Israel, uh, the, the all 12 tribes. And he says, there's coming a day when there's not going to be evangelism in Israel. They will all know, they will all love, they will all obey. Um, how do we know God will keep his word from this text? Verse 35 to the end of the chapter. We won't read the whole thing. But thus says Yahweh, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea, Yahweh of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from me, declares Yahweh, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. If the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will also cast off all the offspring of Israel for all they've done. What is God's promise? I know they're disobedient. I told them to circumcise their hearts. And I will circumcise their hearts. And they will be obedient. And then all the blessings that were promised, including land, including material prosperity, including a a sea of descendants, all of these things will come to pass. By the way, when Jeremiah 31 is quoted in the New Testament, the same recipients are actually designated. In Romans, when this text is quoted, the inclusion of Israel and the house of Jacob are the recipients in the New Testament. In other words, these promises do not get transferred or altered or abrogated. One interesting feature of all the New Covenant texts, all the New Covenant promises uh, when they are outlined by God for us, 
they include spiritual and material elements. Prosperity in the agriculture and numerous cattle and reinvigorated cities along with spiritual hearts that are soft toward the Lord. You cannot separate those elements out and still have the covenant. And this takes us all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, where God was making a promise to Abram and his seed for land, people, blessing, and greatness, and a blessing to all the nations. And what's fascinating is where the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant and the Mosaic covenant all converge is in this new covenant where God actually brings them into the land, gives them all the boundaries that he promised that they've never yet experienced, the material blessings, the peace and the safety that he promised that they've never yet experienced when he changes their hearts. And this is going to help us. Understanding the connection between the new covenant and the other covenants to Israel is going to help us understand Israel's present condition when, when we'll, we'll ask the question, is the modern state of Israel, are they beneficiaries of the promises of God? <laughs> and, and we're going to look at the Old Testament and say, well, not yet. <laughs> what is God going to do? That's going to lead us to a right view of the future of Israel. We can't assume that Israel gets to be in the land, gets to keep the land, gets to be blessed, gets to have prosperity and safety apart from repentance, Israel needs the gospel. And one day Israel will believe the gospel. We'll come to those things. We should ask this morning, what is our participation as Gentiles in this new covenant? You may remember at the Last Supper, Jesus held up the cup and he said, this cup poured out for you, my blood is the new covenant. What's going on there? Is Jesus saying all that prosperity stuff, all the cattle and the land and the blessings to the nations, all the Israel and Judah and Jacob and the tribes, um, all that really is just a spiritual metaphor for forgiveness of sins for Gentiles in the 21st century. Is that what Jesus is saying? Keep in mind in the upper room there, Jesus is with 11 men who are Jews. And he's going to the cross as Messiah to suffer for sin, but it's not his only coming. He comes back to the earth, still yet future, as Messiah to fulfill what we already read in Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 33. To be the king over the earth and to reign on David's throne from Jerusalem. The Old Testament promises, the New Testament promises about the throne of David and the person of Messiah and the fulfillment of God's promises will all come to pass. I like to say it this way, we Gentiles get to participate now in the spiritual benefits of the new covenant which is not yet fulfilled. I know that was a very technical sentence. I'll say it again. We Gentiles get to participate in the spiritual benefits now of the new covenant which is not yet fulfilled. When will the new covenant fulfill, be fulfilled? When all the stipulations of the covenant promises come to pass. They haven't come to pass yet. It's not fulfilled. We participate in the spiritual blessings of what the new covenant provides. Do you have a soft heart? heart of flesh rather than a heart of stone, a circumcised heart? Do you have a new heart in the language of Deuteronomy and Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 37? Have you been raised from the dead by the power of the Spirit? Have you been born again? Yes, you and I benefit from the spiritual blessings of a heart turned Godward. And guess what? Any faithful Jew under the old covenant who believed Yahweh experienced the same. They got to benefit in the spiritual blessings of being connected to God by faith, having their sins covered. Listen, people didn't get saved in the Old Testament by, by any other means than the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Salvation in the Old Testament was by grace alone, 
through faith alone and the provision of God through substitutionary sacrifice. The animal sacrifices previewed what Christ would do. This is the point of the book of Hebrews. That old covenant which included those animal sacrifices previewing the work of Christ is obsolete now that Christ has come. But Hebrews says he is the inaugurator of the new covenant. Hebrews does not tell us the the new covenant's been fulfilled. That is still yet future. And we'll deal with that when we come to Israel's future. What does all this matter for us? Why why is it important that that God is a covenant-keeping God? Turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 9. This Equipping Hour series is about Israel, past, present, and future. But I think you already know it's about you. And I don't mean there's an equal sign between those two things. But when Paul is writing a letter explaining the gospel to a primarily Gentile audience in Rome, about as far away as you could have imagined from Jerusalem in that day, He gives this sentence in Romans 9, 6. It is not as though the word of God has failed. What should you be thinking if you're reading the letter from Paul the Apostle? You're sitting in Rome, you get this letter, it's it's read publicly, maybe you're hearing it for the first time. The word of God has failed. It's not as though the word of God has failed. What is that about? Think back to Romans chapter 8 chock full of promises. If God's promises to Israel in the Old Testament fall to the ground, what good are the promises in Romans 8? There is therefore no, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What good are the promises of no separation? Nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, in Messiah Jesus our Lord. What should you be thinking when you get to Romans chapter 9? Hey, I'm, I'm in Rome. Uh, we heard what the Jews did to Messiah. Uh, now they're, they're mostly unbelievers. They are cut off for their unbelief. Didn't, make God, didn't God make promises to them? Those promises fail. The Word of God falls apart. And if the Word of God falls apart for Israel, for whom God made promises over thousands of years, what what, what good are these promises that Paul just wrote to me in a letter last week? Do you understand the dilemma? What's at stake in Romans 9-6? The Word of God is at stake in Romans 9-6. The character of God is at stake. The integrity of God is at stake. And Christian, your hope is is at stake. Your hope is at stake in this. And and next week we'll unfold what is Paul's answer to Romans 9.6. How how does he go about answering the the possible conjecture that the word of God has failed because Israel is separated for unbelief? He's going to give fundamentally three reasons why the word of God has not failed. God keeps a remnant. God is faithful. Not every Jew is actually born again. And there's a day coming where God will keep all of the promises. Genesis 3.15, Genesis 12, 2 Samuel 7, Jeremiah 31. And they will culminate in a national, spiritual Israel. Something we ought to pray for. Something we ought to long for. And frankly, a, a future history that we depend on for our very lives as it relates to the integrity of God and the Word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your promises. As we think back to Moses being put in a deep and dreadful sleep while you tread alone through the carcasses of animals, we rejoice that there are promises that you make that are not dependent on the the feeble and fickle ways of man. That even my standing before you is grounded in the finished work of Jesus Christ, not on my obediences, not on my faithfulness, 
Lord, we thank you that you are a God who does not waver. Oh, if we were in your shoes, we would have been rid of us long ago. But you have kept us by your grace for your glory. And we pray that your name would receive all honor for your ineffable work. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.